This is Your Anxiety Toolkit, episode number 287. Welcome to Your Anxiety Toolkit. I'm your host, Kimberly Quinlan. This podcast is fueled by three main goals. The first goal is to provide you with some extra tools to help you manage your anxiety. Second goal, to inspire you. Anxiety doesn't get to decide how you live your life. And number three, and I leave the best for last, is to provide you with one big fat virtual hug. Because experiencing anxiety ain't easy. If that sounds good to you, let's go. Welcome back, everybody. I am so excited. We are at episode six of this six part series of how to manage mental compulsions. You guys, we could not end this series with anyone better than Dr. Lisa Coyne. I don't know if you've heard of Lisa Coyne. I bet you, you probably have. She is the most wonderful human being. I have met Lisa, Dr. Lisa Coyne, multiple times online, never in person, and just loved her. And this was my first time of actually really getting to spend some really precious time with her. And oh my gosh, my heart exploded like a million times. And you will hear in this episode, like you will hear my heart exploding at some point, I am sure. (laughs) So I am so honored to finish out the six-part series with Lisa. This series, let me just share with you how joyful it has felt to be able to deliver this as a a series, as a, you know, back-to-back piece of hope. I'm hoping it has been a piece of hope for you in managing something really, really difficult, which is managing mental compulsions. Now, as we finish this series up. I may or may not want to do like a recap. I'm not sure yet. I'm going to just sort of see where my heart falls. But I want to just really first, as we move into this final part of the series, is just to remind you, take what you need. You've been given literally back to back some of the best advice I have ever heard in regards to managing mental compulsions, where we've got world-renowned experts on this series. You might have either found it so, so educational and so, so helpful, while also feeling sometimes a little bit like, oh my goodness, there's so many tools, which one do I use? And I really want to emphasize to you as we finish this out, again, so beautiful, what a beautiful ending. I almost feel like crying. As we finish it out, I really want to remind you, take what you need take what's helpful or, well, I should say, and try all of them out. Practice with each of the skills and the concepts and the tools. See what happens when you do. Use them as little experiments. Just keep plugging away with these skills and tools because number one, they're all evidence-based. I very carefully picked the experts on this series to make sure that we're bringing you evidence-based, really gold standard treatment. So that's been a priority. Just practice with them. Don't be hard on yourself as you practice them. Remind yourself this is a long-term journey, right? These are skills I still practice. I'm sure everyone who's come on the show, they're still practicing them. And so I really want to send you off with a, a sense of hope that you get to play around with these, be playful with them. Some of them will be, you know, we've giggled and we've laughed and we've cried, right? So I want you to just be gentle as you proceed and you practice um, and remind yourself this is a process and a journey. That being said, I am going to take you right into this next part of the six part series with Dr. Lisa Coyne. This is where we bring it home. And boy, does she bring it home. Like she, I feel like she beautifully ties it all up in a ribbon. And I hope it has been so helpful for you. Really, I do. I want this to be a resource that you share with other people who are struggling. I want to be a resource that you return to when you're struggling. I want it to be a place where you feel understood and validated 
And so thank you so much for being a part of this amazing series. That being said, let's get over onto the show. And here is Dr. Lisa Coyne. Well, I literally feel like I'm almost in tears because I know this is going to be the last of the series and I'm so excited. I had just said this is going to bring it home. I'm so (laughs) excited to have Dr. Lisa Coyne. Welcome. Thank you. So nice to be here with you, Kim. Hi, everyone. Yes. Okay. So, (laughs) So first of all, the question I've asked everybody and I really am loving the response is, this is a series on managing mental compulsions, but do you call them mental compulsions, mental rituals, rumination? Like how do you conceptualize this whole concept? I would say I, it depends on the person and it depends on what they're doing. I call them any number of things, but I think the most important thing, um, at least for me and how I think about this, is that we come at it from a very behavioral perspective, right? Where we really understand that, the, you know, and this is true for probably all humans, you know, but especially so for OCD, I have a little bit of it myself, where right? I get caught up in the ruminations. Um, but there's, there's a triggering thought, you might call it a, a trigger, like a, a recurrent intrusive thought that pops up. Mm -hmm. Or an antecedent is another word that we think of when we think of behavior analysis. But after that thought comes up, what happens is the person engages in an on-purpose thing, whatever it is that they do in their mind. It could be, you know, replacing it with a good thought. It could be an argument with yourself. It could be... I just need to go over it one more time. It could be, I'm going to worry about this so I can solve it in advance, right? And that part is the part that we think of as the compulsion, right? So it's a thing we're doing on purpose in our minds to somehow give us some relief or safety from that initial thought. Now, the tricky part is this. It doesn't always feel like it's something we're doing on purpose. It might feel so second nature that it too feels automatic. So part of, I think, the work is really noticing what does it feel like when you're engaging in this activity? So like for me, if I'm worrying about something and worry is an example of this kind of doing in your mind, right? Um, It comes with like a sense of, of like urgency or tightness, or I just have to figure it out, or what if I, you know, and it's all about reducing uncertainty, really, Mm. right? So the trick that I do when I notice it in me is I'll be like, okay, I'm noticing that urgency, that tension, that kind of distress. What am I up to in my head? Am I solving something? Is that? And then I'll kind of step back and notice what I'm up to. So that's one of my little tricks that I teach my Mm. clients. I love this. Would you say your predominant modality is acceptance and commitment therapy? What would you say predominantly you, I mean, I know you're skilled in so many things, but what would (laughs) you? I would say, so it's funny because like, yeah, I guess you would. I mean, I'm pretty skilled in that. I'm an act trainer. Um, Although I I did start with CBT and I, you know, would, would say that I, for OCD, I really stick to ERP, but mm. I think of it as like the, the heart of the intervention, but I, we do it within the context of ACT. Um, can you tell oh, me yeah, can, what yeah. that would look like? And I'm, I'm just so interested to, un- to understand it from mm. that um, sort of conceptualization. Sure. So, so you're okay. talking about sort of this idea, we you know we've talked a lot about like it's how you respond to your thoughts and mm-hmm. how you respond to the yeah. antecedent and so forth. And and then of course you respond with ERP. And what does ACT look like? Okay. Yeah. In that experience. Like I'd love to hear what you're right from your mouth. <laughs> okay. All right. So I'm gonna do my best here to like kind of just say it and then we'll see if if it sounds more like ACT or it sounds more like ERP. And then you'll Mm. see what I mean when I say I kind of do both of them. So when you, when you think about OCD, when you think about anxiety um, or even maybe depression, right? Where you're stuck in rumination, 
somebody is having an experience, right? We call it a private event, like feeling, thought, belief that hurts, whatever it is. And what they're doing is everything that they can to get away from that, right? So if it's OCD, there's a scary thought or feeling, and then there's a ritual that you do. So to fix that, you know, it's all about learning to turn towards, right? And approach that thing that's hard, okay? And there's different ways you can do that. You can do that in a way where you're kind of dialing it in and you're like, yeah, I'm going to do the thing, but you're kind of doing everything that you can to not feel while you're doing that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's sometimes where people get stuck doing straight up exposure and response prevention, right? It's also hard. Like <laughs> when I was a little kid, I was really scared to go off the high dive. I tell my clients and my team this story sometimes where I'm, um, it was like a three meter dive. And I was that kid where I would be like, I'm going to do it. All the other kids are doing it. And I would climb up, I'd walk to the end of the board, freak out, walk back, climb down. And I did this so many times one day. And there's like a long line of other kids like waiting to get in the water. And they were pissed. So yeah. <laughs> I did, I got up and I walked out to the end of the board and I was like, I can't. And I turned around to go back and there was my swim coach at the other side of the board with his arms crossed. <laughs> and I was like, oh no. Like, this and is not like, the way I planned. <laughs> right? And he's like, no, you're going. <laughs> right? wow. so it's, it's And I went, which was amazing. And sometimes you do need that push. But the point is that it's really hard to get yourself to do those really mm. hard things sometimes when it matters. Mm. So to me, ACT brings two pieces to the table that are really, really important here. Right? You can divide ACT into two sets of processes. There's your acceptance and mindfulness processes. And then there's your commitment and valuing processes, right? Which are the engine of ACT. The how do we get there? So for the first part, mindfulness is really paying attention on purpose. And if you want to really learn from an exposure, right? You have to be in your body. You have yeah. to be noticing. You have to be willing to allow all of the thoughts and sensations and whatever shows up to show up. And so act as ideal at shaping that skill set for when you're in the exposure, right? So that's how we kind of think of it that way. Mm -hmm. And then the valuing and commitment is how do you get yourself off that diving board? There has to be something much more important right? Bigger, much bigger than your fear to help motivate you for why to do this hard thing, right? And I think that the valuing piece and really connecting with the things that we most deeply care about is part of what helps with that too. So I think those two bookends are really, really important. And there's other ways to think about it, but those are the two primary ways that we kind of like do ERP but we do it within an act mm. framework. Mm. Okay. So I love this. So you're talking about kind of, we know what we need to do, right? We right. know that rumination isn't helpful. We know that mm -hmm. it creates pain. We know that it keeps us stuck. Yeah. And we also know, let's jump to like, we know we have to drop it ultimately. Right. What might be an example of values or commitments that people make specifically for rumination, the solving, like, do you have any mm. examples that might yeah, be helpful? Totally can. Yeah, I'm just thinking of like, you know, there's, there's a bunch of them. But for example, let's take, for example, like ROCD, relationship OCD, right? So let's say someone's in a relationship with a partner, and they're not sure it's the right partner is, you know, are they cheating on me? Are they not? Blah, 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 blah. And it's this kind of like, but I have to solve if this is the right person or not. Am I going to be safe or whatever the particular worry is? And so one of the things that you can do is once folks notice they're trying to solve that, notice what's the effect of that on your actual relationship? Mm. How is that actually working, right? So there's this stepping back where in ACT we would call that diffusion, right? Or, or taking perspective self as context. Mm -hmm. um, 
which is another act acceptance and mindfulness piece. And first of all, notice that. Second of all, pause. Notice what you're up to. Is the intent here to build a strong relationship or is the intent to make this uncertainty go away? And then to choose, right? Do I want to work on uncertainty or do I want to work on being a loving partner and seeing what happens? Because there's so much we're not in charge of, including what we're thinking and feeling, right? But we are in charge of what we choose to do. And so choosing to be present and see where it goes, right? And embracing that uncertainty, but the joyfulness of it, I think is really, really important. So that would be one example. Mm -hmm. I love that example. Actually, I'm actually, as you were saying, I was thinking about an experience of my own, like when your own fears come up yeah. around relationships, and you're even about you're ruminating about a conversation or something, you've got to stop and be like, oh, is this getting in the way here? Like of the actual thing? I'm afraid. <laughs> right. it's so, so true. Tell me about this joy piece. Because it's not very often you hear the word joy in a conversation about mental compulsions. <laughs> what? The, tell me Good about point. that. <laughs> well, when you start really noticing how this is working, and if you are, if you're able, if you're willing to kind of step back from it, let it be, and like stay where you are in that uncertainty. All sorts of new things show up. Mm. right stuff you never could have imagined or never could have dreamed right your whole life could be just popping up all of these possibilities like in that moment you stop engaging with those compulsions like you could go in a hundred different directions if you're willing to let the uncertainty be there and i think that that's really important you know mm. so i'm thinking of i'm trying to I want to tell a story, but I have to like change the details in my head to, you know, just for confidentiality. But I'm thinking of um, a person who I have worked with who, you know, would be stuck and ruminating about, is this the right thing? And I could make decisions. And how do I, for example, how do I do this lecture? You know, and I need my slides and I need to be perfect and ruminating, ruminating, ruminating about how it works. And one day they decided okay, I'm just going to, I'm just going to be present and I'm just going to teach. And they taught with a partner and the person themselves noticed like, wow, I felt so much more connected to my students. Mm -hmm. This was amazing. And the, the, the partner teaching with them was like, I've never seen you so on. That was amazing. Mm -hmm. And like, they contacted this joy and like, oh, this is what it could be like. Yeah. Like, yeah. And it's like this freedom shows up for you. Right. Um, and it's something that, you know, we think we know, right? And OCD loves to know and it loves to tell you it knows the whole story about everything. And it's what you get back when you stop doing the compulsions, if you really, really choose that, is so much more than just, oh, I'm okay. Mm. I noticed that thought. Mm. It's so much more than that. It's It's like, Yes, and you get to do all this amazing stuff, right? You know, it's funny. I always have my clients in my head when someone says something. I'm like imagining my client going, "But like, but but like, what what's the buts that are coming?" So, and notice that process. But see, that's it. Yeah, that's your mind. That's their minds kind of jumping back in, being like, "See, there it is again." Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, so and what if we just don't know? We well, and out. this is what I love about this. So. You're, you're, I agree with you. There have been so many times where I, when I've dropped my, I've dropped myself out of, I call it being heady and I drop into my body mm -hmm. and you get this experience of being like, wow. Like for me, I can get really simple on like, isn't it crazy that water is clear? Like I can yes. go to that place. Like, <laughs> yeah. Water is clear. That is incredible. You know what I mean? Like, yep. so to go to that degree. Oh, no. But then, so that's the joy in it for me, right? It's yeah. like, wow, like somebody literally figured out how to make this pen work. That still blows my mind. You know, I had, I had a moment. I started um, horseback riding again for the first time and like literally, like I've ridden on and off like once a year or something, but like really riding and actually it was, you know, taking classes and stuff for the first time in 30 years. And uh, they put me in this class 
And I didn't know what level it was. I just thought we were just going to walk around and trot and canter and all this stuff. <laughs> she starts setting up jumps. And I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> like, this is an old body now. Like, oh, this is not going to bounce the way it might have. You know? <laughs> and so it's me and all these 15-year-olds in the class. Wow. And I'm third in line. And I'm just, like, on the horse absolutely panicking and ruminating like oh my god am i gonna die should i do this what am i gonna do and like should i tell her no but i kind of want it and i don't know what i'm gonna and my head was just so loud and so the two girls in front of me go and then i look at the teacher and i go emily are you sure <laughs> it's literally the first time i've ever done this in 30 years and she just went <laughs> she just <laughs> looked at me and i noticed that my legs squeezed the horse mm with all of the stuff rolling around in my head and I went over the jump and it was, I didn't die. It was really messy and terrifying. And oh my God, it was so exciting and yep. joyful. And I was yep. so proud of myself. Yeah. Yeah. That's what you get when you start. Yeah. And I've heard don't. that from so many clients too, right? Like so awesome. It's like, I always say it's like base jumping. It's like, you've got to jump. And then you've once you've jumped, it's you just got to be there, right? And that is true. There is so much exhilaration yes. and fear that comes from that. So yeah. I love that. What about those who base jump or squeeze the horse, mm -hmm. and they're dropping into discomfort that they haven't even experienced before, like yeah. ten out of ten stuff? Like, can you sort of sort of work walk me through? What is it do? just the same? Is it the same concept? What would you advise there? So I think it's important to notice that when that happens, right, people are not just experiencing physical sensations of emotions, but it's also whatever their mind is telling them about it. Mm. And I think it's this is another place where ACT is super helpful to just notice like your mind is saying this is 10 out of 10. What does that mean to you? That means like, oh my gosh. And just sort of noticing that and holding it lightly while you're in that 10 out of 10 moment, I think is really, really helpful, mm. right? So for example, I have a, a really intense fear of heights where I actually like freeze. Mm. Like, like I can't actually move when I'm like on the edge of something. And I had a young client who I've worked with for a while and as an exposure for her, but also for me as her clinician to model, we decided she, she wanted me to go walk, rock climbing with her, which is not something I've ever done ever. And also fear of heights. So I kept telling myself, even fear of heights, this is going to suck. This, this is going to, this is going to be terrible. This is going to be terrible, terrible. And there was also another part of me like kind of interested and curious, mm. right? And so what I would say, when you're in that 10 out of 10 moment, you can always be curious. So when you're like, oh my gosh, I'm really scared. The moment you're unwilling to feel that is the moment it's going to overwhelm you. Mm. And if you can notice, I'm notice it as a thought. I'm having the thought that I, I don't think I can handle this. I don't think I'm going to survive this and notice it and be curious. Let's see what happens. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I noticed, interestingly, even though I am terrified of heights, I wasn't actually scared at all. Mm -hmm. And that was a shocker, mm -hmm. right? Because I was full sure it was going to be the worst thing ever. Right. And so notice the stories your mind tells you about what an experience is going to be and stay curious. You mm. can always be curious. And that's going to be, I think, your number one tool for finding your way through and how to handle those really big, unexpected and inevitable surprising moments that happen in life, right? Mm. That are really scary for all of us. Right. And when you say curious, just because I'm not trying to like get too nit nitpicky on, on terms, but for you, for me, curiosity mm -hmm. is let's see if let's experiment. I always think of it like life's in a, a science experiment. Like mm -hmm. let's see if my hypothesis is true about this rock climbing. Is there a way that you explain curiosity? Yeah. 
Well, it's kind of more so it's it's that is part of it, but it's also part like what you were describing, like, isn't water cool? Yes. It's it's more than is this true or not true? That's so narrow. Yeah. You want like, no, really, what does this taste like? What mm. is every you want to really like? And that's the mindfulness piece. It's yep. like really notice all of it. There's so much there, you know, and when you start sort of doing that, you'll find even if you do it outside of exposure, for example, it's practice, you start to notice that like the present moment is a little bit like Hermione's purse mm -hmm. and Harry Potter, right? Right. Where you think it's this one thing. And then when you start to expand your awareness, you notice there's tons of cool stuff. Yeah. Right? So in these big, scary moments, what you might see is a sense of purpose or a sense of, holy crap, I'm handling this and I didn't think I could. And wow, this is amazing. Or I'm really terrified. And oh my gosh, my nose itches. Or like it could be anything at all. Right? Yeah. But the bottom line is our bodies were meant to feel and yeah. they were meant to experience all the emotions. And so there is no amount of emotion or fear or anything that we are not built to handle. Mm. right mm. emotions are information right and to stay in the storm when it's such a big storm when ocd is kind of ramping you up teaches the ocd actually i guess i get to stand down here mm -hmm. eventually i guess i don't need to freak out about this so much huh interesting i had no right. idea right yeah so yeah. I don't know if that's helpful or not. But. No, it's so helpful. It, it, it is so helpful because I think if you've practiced curiosity, it makes sense. But for someone who maybe has been in mental compulsions for so long, they haven't really strengthened that curiosity oh, that's muscle. That's so true. Right. So right? start small. Yeah. Don't start in the storm. Start with like, you know, waking up in the morning and noticing before you open your eyes, what do you hear? Yeah. How do the covers feel? Right. You know? Like, do you hear the birds outside your window? Start with that and right. start in little moments just practicing during the day. Start a conversation with someone you care about. Notice what your mind is saying in response to them. Mm. You know, notice what it's like to notice their face. Right. Like, start small, build it up, and then start practicing with little tiny other kinds of discomfort. Sometimes we'll tell people, like, impatience when you're waiting in line or mm. hunger or tiredness you know any of those um to just kind of bring your full awareness to that and be like what is it like inside this moment right now and then you can extend that to okay so what if we choose to approach the scary thing what if we choose to just for a few seconds notice what it feels like in this uncertain space, right? And that's how you might begin to bring it to rumination. Be curious about what was the triggering thought. Mm. And then before you start, you know, ruminating or before you start doing mental rituals, just notice the first thought and then just kind of, you don't have to answer that question, mm. you know? And there's different ways to handle that, but curiosity is the beginning you know, and then stopping the compulsion is ultimately, or undoing it or undermining it in some way is going to be the, the other important piece. Hey, everybody, it's Kimberly here. Sorry to interrupt your show. I just wanted to remind you that this free six part series is hosted and sponsored by cbtschool.com. Head on over to cbtschool.com. You'll get incredible, compassion-focused resources for obsessive-compulsive disorder, anxiety disorders, and body-focused repetitive behaviors. We have tons of free trainings. You can sign up for our free weekly newsletter that sends you weekly resources and skills. We have a whole study vault of online courses and so much more. So head over to cbtschool.com for more information and let's get back to the show. So I'd love to hear more about commitment. Um, mm. I always... I, I I always loved when I, I have multiple clients, we joke about this all the time uh, and about, you know, 
they'll say, I had these mental compulsions and I was, you know, he would be so proud. I was so proud. I was able to like, you know, catch it and pull myself awesome. back into the present. And it, yes, Beautiful. it was such a win. And then I had another thought and you'd be so proud of me. I did the same thing. And then I had another thought and, <laughs> that <was laughs> and you're like, was that a ritual that you just did right there? <laughs> Yeah, it's sneaky, huh? <laughs> right. And so I'd love to hear what you're like, and, and maybe bring it from an act perspective or however you would is, okay, you're, you're, it's like you're chugging away. You're chugging away. I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I look at me go. But this, this, you know, OCD can be so persistent. It's so tricky. And, and yeah, so is there, is there, is that the commitment piece? Do you think, what is that? How would you address that? Um, sort of so if I'm getting experience. your question right, you're asking about like, what, what, what do we do when OCD hijacks something that you should, yeah. and turns it into a ritual? Is that yeah. what you're asking? Yeah. Yes. Or it just is, is OCD kind of turns up the volume and is like, no, 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 you are going to have to tend to me or I'm not going to stop kind of thing. Okay. Yes, that is a commitment piece. And it's funny because like, there's different ways that I think about this, but it's almost like, a, a little child who has a tantrum. Like, mm -hmm. if you keep saying yes, every time they make the tantrum bigger, it's going to end up being a pretty big tantrum. And OCD loves nothing more than a good tantrum, right? Mm -hmm. so <laughs> and true. so the thing you have to do is plan for that and go, yeah, it's going to get loud. Yeah, it's going to say whatever it needs to say. And it's going to say the worst thing I can think of and I have had my clients call this all sorts of different things, like second, first order thoughts, second order thoughts, like just different variations on the theme where it's going to ramp up to hook you in. And so kind of really staying very mindful of that mm -hmm. and making a promise to yourself. Like one of my clients who helped us a lot in teaching, but also in writing stuff that's loud, Ethan, I think said it in this really elegant way. He said, make a promise to yourself that really matters. Even if it's small, it doesn't matter like how, the, how big it is. But, you know, one of his first ones was under no circumstances am I going to do X, the compulsion. And keep that promise to yourself. Because if you, anybody who ever woke up and didn't want to get out of the bed in the morning because, ah, oh, it's too tired, it's too early, I don't really want to go to the gym, uh, you know, like if you know, if you're in that conversation with yourself about the, well, maybe just one more minute, you're, you've already lost, mm. already lost. And so this is a good place again for that act piece of diffusion, right? Mm. Noticing you, your mind or your OCD or your anxiety is pulling you into, ah, let's just kind of see if we can string you along here. And so what needs to happen is just move your feet and put them on the floor. Mm. Don't talk, don't get into that conversation with yourself. Right. Um, and having that commitment piece, that promise to myself with the added value piece, right? That really matters. Right. Right. And one other thing that's sometimes helpful that I have, um, I'll use this myself, but I also um, teach my clients, you know, remembering this question, like, if this is a step towards whatever it is that's really important, am I willing to allow myself to feel these things? Mm. Right? Mm. Like, am I willing? And remembering that as a cue, like we're not here. It's never about like this one exposure. It's about this is a step towards this other life. Right. That you are fighting for it every single step is an investment in that other life where you're getting closer and you're making it more possible. And just remembering that, I think that that's an, a really important piece. Mm, yeah, it actually perfectly answered the question I had, which is, you know, you're making a commitment, but what to? And it is that right. long-term version mm -hmm. of you that you're moving towards or the value that you want to be living by. Absolutely. Yeah. Would you suggest, and I've done a little bit of work on the podcast about values. Maybe one day we can have you back on and you can share Love more <laughs> more about that. But would mm. you suggest people pick one value, three values? Like how, how might someone 
you know, after, of course, we all have these values and sometimes OCD can take things from us, right? Or anxiety can take those things from us. How would you encourage someone to move in that direction? Well, actually, do you want to do a fun thing? I do. Okay. So let's do. I've never, been, you, I never would say no to that. <laughs> You're like, that's a good question. Of course, I want to I do a fun thing. To you. I'm really okay. curious about this fun thing. All right. So, do you like coffee, or are you a tea person, or neither? I let's go tea. I'm an Australian. If I didn't say tea, I would be a terrible Aussie. They'd like okay. They'd like kick you off the, <laughs> the continent. All right. So, Kim, think think about in your life a perfect cup of tea, not just like a taste, right? But like a moment, like with someone maybe you cared about or somewhere that was beautiful or after something big or before something big, or just think about like what was like a really, really amazing, important cup of tea that you've had in your life. Oh, it's so easy. Do I tell you out loud? Yeah, if you want to. Yeah, that'd be great. So I'll paint you guys a picture. So I live in America, but my parents live in Australia and they have this beautiful house on a huge ranch. I grew up on a farm Mm -hmm. and we're sitting at their bay window and you're overlooking like green. It's just rolling hills. Mm -hmm. And my mom is on my left and my dad is on my right. And it's like milky and there's cookies. Well, they call them biscuits. So yeah, mm. that's that's like my happy place right there. Happy place. And I could see it in your face when you're talking yeah. about it. Yeah. So, so does that tell you something about what's really important to you? That yes. You? What does it tell you? Um, family and pleasure and just savoring goodness, like Mm. just slowing down. It's not about winning a race or it's not about, it's just about this savoring. Being Um, in the world. Yeah. And, and I think there's a lot, so maybe something there that I think is important is the green, like the nature, the, the, the calm of that. Yeah. So as you talk about that, what are you noticing feeling? Oh my God, my heart just like exploded 12 times. <laughs> like my heart is filled. filled. So, like that was the funnest thing I've ever done in my whole life. Right? Funnest so, is not a word. <laughs> what if you could build your life around moments like that? Would that be a well of life for you? Mm, mm, I think about that nearly every time I make tea, actually. Right? Yeah. That's how you would help your clients. And that's one way to think about values. Wow. That is so cool. I feel like you just did like a spell on me or something. You just connected with the stuff that's really important. So like when you think about if I had a hard thing to do, what if it was a step towards more of that in your life? Yeah. You see? It's so powerful. I've never (laughs) had that. Oh my God. That was gold. (laughs) That was old. And have you, you yes. just, and so that's the ex- example. Like everyone would use that coffee or tea. There you go. Just think about it. And it's funny because we came up with this in our team like maybe three months ago. And I, we keep, we keep piloting like just a new little values exercise. But it's so funny how compelling it is. Yeah. Like just thinking about like, gosh, you know, like, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, that we could, I could tell you about mine, but you get the point. So. Well, and you know, what's so funny too, and I will say is, and this is completely off topic is there's a, there's a social media person that I follow on Instagram mm. and every time she does a lot, and for some reason, it's so funny that you mentioned this is I love what she talks about, but to be honest, I'm not there to watch her talk. The thing that I love the most is that she starts every live with a new tea and she, <laughs> And she pours the water in front of you. It's like a mindfulness exercise for me. It's, it's like, a it's to be honest, I, I find myself like watching to see whether she's making tea, not that this is about tea, but I think there's something very mindful about those things that where we slow down and we're like the water example, like she's pouring it and you're, she's watching the tea. And for some reason that's like, it's like a little mini break in the day for me. Totally agree. 
Yeah. It's one of these things you said, like, if you can, it's like it's the whole sky, the cloud and the tea and the, like Thich the, Nhat Han, was yes, it? Yes, yes, yes. I can't remember the quote, but exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, oh my gosh, I love that example. <laughs> so good. Well, actually, if you don't mind, can you tell us your tea? Because I just would love to see if there's a variation. So what would yours be? So it was funny because I think I did coffee the first time I did this, but then recently I just did a workshop in um, Virginia and I was like, oh my gosh, tea. And what came to mind was when I took my 17 year old daughter trekking in the Himalayas to Nepal, right? Cause I wanted her, she was graduating from high school and I wanted to show her that you could do anything. Mm -hmm. And she really wanted to go, we both really wanted to go to Everest base camp. Wow. And every morning after, you know, trekking nine, 10, 11 hours a day where you're freezing cold, you're, exhausted everything's hurting and it's also amazing and beautiful the guides would knock at our door and there would be two of them and one of them would have a tray of little metal cups and then the other one would say tea sugar would you like sugar and they would make you they would bring you and this was how you woke up every morning a wow. steaming cup of tea sometimes the rooms were 20 below zero and there they were and you get out of bed and you'd be so grateful for that yeah. warm cup of tea. And that was the tea I remembered. Right. And then the values you pulled from that would be what? Like, I'm guessing. That um, moment was, I, it was about being with my daughter and it was a being about like showing her, like modeling courage and modeling like willingness and and just adventure and this love of kind of being in nature and taking a journey and seeing like could we do this and what would it be like and just sharing the experience with her you yeah know? So yeah just beautiful so, and and the tea is right in the center of that so it's almost not even about the tea no but it's that moment it's that like that time and that experience so amazing so amazing <laughs> thank you i'm deeply grateful like that was oh, that just filled my heart i'm so I, glad i, I tell, feel so honored that you had that experience i, I did, love that so I much did. i always tell my clients or my kids or whoever is that my, when i was a kid my mom every afternoon when i came home from school she'd say what's the one thing you learn at school today you know and so still I, there's always one thing i learn and i always note it like that's the one thing i learned today and that was it like oh, what, uh, what an amazing so moment much. right yeah. I'm so glad. Okay. So love it. I love this. So we've talked about uh, mindfulness and we've talked about commitment. We've talked about values and we have talked about the acceptance piece, but if you could just have just one more question around the mm -hmm. acceptance piece, sure. um, how does that fit into this model? I, I'm just yeah. wondering. So, you know, it's funny because I always feel like that acceptance piece, like the, the word, right? It, it means to so many people, I think tolerance or coping or like, mm -hmm. let's just make this okay. And it doesn't mean any of those things. And so I've moved more into thinking of it and describing it as it's, it's like a willingness. Yeah. You know, like what is under the hood of acceptance and it's, am I willing, you know, cause you can not like something and not want something and also be willing to allow it mm. and it's almost like this you know again it, it involves curiosity about it it involves like squeeze the horse with all the stuff right get the feet on the floor even though you're having an argument it's in your head and so sometimes people think about it as a feeling and sometimes it is but a lot of times it's willingness with your feet mm. you know like when you think about moms and infants in the middle of the night, like, I don't think there was ever a moment when I was like, oh, yay, the baby's crying at four in the morning. I'm so excited to get up and I, I'm feeling in my heart like, no, it's like you're exhausted. And it's like the last thing you want to do. And you 100 percent you're willing to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Right? You choose. And so it's that's the difference. And so mm -hmm. I think people get tangled up 
not just in thinking of it as tolerance, but also waiting for a feeling of willingness to happen. Mm. And that's not it. It's, it's a choice. That's it's a gold. choice, right? It's gold. Like, yeah, seriously. And that, I mean, it's the same thing. I learn it every day. Trust me, when I fall out of my gym routine or my running routine, and I'm like off the willingness. Yeah. And then I'm like, yeah, that's not it. And I have to come back to it. So yeah. just it's something we all struggle with. And I think that's really important to know too. But yeah. ultimately, it's a choice. Yeah, not uh, a feeling. Okay, this is that was the perfect, and I'm like so happy. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, tell I thank you. Number one, this has been just beautiful for me, and I'm sure the gifts just keep going and flowing from this conversation. So thank you. Thank um, you for having. Tell me where people can hear more about you, you know, know your work. Well, we're at the New England Center for OCD and Anxiety in Boston. Mm -hmm. And we have recently opened in New York City and in Ireland. And so if anybody is in Ireland, call us, look us up. Wow. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's been really fun. And um, there's a few books we have. There's Stuff That's Loud by Ben Sedley and myself. There's our newest book called Stop Avoiding Stuff with Matt Boone and Jen Gregg. And that's a fun little book. And if it's, if you're, if anybody's interested in learning about ACT, it's really written, the chapters are each standalone and they're written so that you could read them in about two minutes. And that was on purpose. We wanted yeah. something that was really pocket-sized and really simple with actionable skills that you could use right away. And then I have a new book coming out actually really soon. And no one knows this. You're actually, I'm announcing this on your show. <gasps> and I am writing it with my colleague, Sarah Cassidy O'Connor in Ireland. And we are just doing the art for it now. And it's a book on ACT for kids with anxiety wow. and OCD. Yeah. When so, is this out? Good question. I want to say within the year, but I don't remember. What That's okay. That's okay. But Reach look out for it. it. Yes. And check out our website and check out Stuff That's Loud website. We'll post it there and let folks know. But yeah, we're really excited about it. And it'll be published by a UK publisher. So it's really cute. So like, I think the language will be much more like Australia, UK, Ireland oh, <laughs> for the US, wonderful. which is really fun because I have a connection to Ireland too. But anyway, there you go. <laughs> yeah, it's so exciting. Congratulations. Yeah, so needed. You. It's funny because I just had a consultation with one of my staff and we were talking about, you know, books for kids and, and there are some great ones, but this, yeah. this act work, I think is, I keep saying it, it's like skills for life, right? Like it really is so important. Really is. How many times I've taught my child, even not related to anxiety, just to act skill. It's been so important. Yeah, mine too. I yeah, mean, I think they're so helpful. They would just really help with flexibility in so many different areas. Right. I agree. So, okay. This is wonderful. Thank you for great. being on. Like I said, you brought it home. You brought it home. <laughs> we'll have our cups of tea now. We will. <laughs> so nice to talk to you, Kim. Thank you. Thank you. Please note that this podcast or any other resources from cbtschool.com should not replace professional mental health care. If you feel you would benefit, please reach out to a provider in your area. Have a wonderful day and thank you for supporting cbtschool.com.